Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the pod. And this is a vulnerable one for me. I share something in this interview that, well, as of the time I'm recording this intro, I haven't shared it beyond just a few close friends, but I will be sharing more about. You'll hear about it if you listen to the interview. It's just a personal choice, but it's, you know, a lot of our personal choices that are public facing can feel very vulnerable and what are people going to think and all that jazz. So stay tuned for the episode if you want to know what the heck I'm talking about there. (laughs) Recently, what I have been watching, I went to see Marvel's and it was incredible. Check my post on Instagram about that that I just made this past weekend. I guess that would have been Friday the 11th, maybe? Saturday the 12th? Something like that? Yeah. Anyway, it was so good. I felt so inspired, similar to how I felt in the Barbie movie, just seen represented in a way that I didn't realize how much I needed. So good. I've been reading, I just started reading this morning, an advanced review copy of Arate by Brian Johnson, who has been one of my teachers for several years now through the Heroic Coach program and all of his work with Optimize, and and it's so good. The best combination of ancient, ancient wisdom and modern science. Oh my gosh, I'm loving it. Highly recommend you get Arate. It's just now coming out on November 14th, I believe is the release date. And you can pre-order and well you can't pre-order by the time you're listening to this but you can order it and that will really help to show that people want this incredible book and it would make an excellent holiday gift because it is a beautifully made book as well so let's see i am loving uh, the fall weather it feels so good and yeah we're still getting these weird spikes of like 80 degrees but for the most part i'm like oh my gosh i'm wearing long sleeves i'm feeling great loving the fall weather Let me tell you about our incredible guest for this episode. Her name is Caitlin Hart, and she is an esthetician here in Nashville, but she also has programs online for folks who are in the beauty and spa industry all over the world. These courses that she's put together, I'm like, girl, I want to get into esthetician so I can take these courses. She has put her heart and soul into these. So you can learn more about those courses if you know anyone in that industry at bit.ly slash beauty pro waitlist. That will be in the show notes. You can follow Caitlin on Instagram at the integrated esthetician and that's esthetician with an E. It'll be in the show notes as well. If you're in Nashville or visiting, you can check out Prism Face Lab, prismfacelab.com on Instagram at prismfacelab. Caitlin Hart is a seasoned esthetician with a remarkable 14-year journey in the beauty and spa industry. In that time, she has built and rebuilt a successful career in multiple states and is the owner of an award-winning skincare clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. She now teaches other beauty professionals how to achieve what she has through coaching, online courses, and podcasting. Oh yes, she has a podcast and I think I'm going to be a guest. She teaches a pragmatic blend of business savvy with a dash of woo, helping others elevate their businesses while nurturing their own well-being and fostering a mindful approach to success. Enjoy this episode with Caitlin Hart. Caitlin, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to chat with you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so one of the things that really grabbed me about your story is that you're you're preaching like to the same choir I'm preaching to <laughs> maybe in different spaces like I know you really focus a lot on folks working in the beauty aesthetics industry but we all have our stories of those of us who are really highly ambitious really driven who succeed but manage to burn ourselves into the ground doing mm-hmm. so so mm-hmm. I would just love to hear a little bit about kind of that arc of like starting from baby esthetician and building and recognizing at whatever point, like you hit that, that burnout phase. Yes. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's been a long journey and it's been ups and downs and I don't want to say that path has been perfectly linear either. Mm -hmm. I think we all have to like hit that reset button a few times in our careers and our lives. But yeah, I mean, I have been an esthetician for 14 years now. I mean, straight out of high school. That's what I went and did. And I mean, I, first of all, I think you have a lot more energy in your (laughs) twenties. You know, yeah, fact. <laughs> um, fact, but I, I mean, I just kind of, I worked and I worked and I hustled and that was like energizing at one point in my yeah. life. And then 
really in my late twenties, I had my son. And so that was a big turning point of like, okay, the only way to like make more money, quote unquote, is to see more clients and push harder. And that's not really an option anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I really can't work till 8 PM with a newborn, (laughs) you know, I can't work six days a week. Like this is not a thing anymore. And so I think that was the first time I had to kind of step outside the box and be like, okay, what are we going to change? How can we change up what services I am providing so that they support me? And I've been through so many evolutions of that since then, cutting back hours and changing the services and, you know, going, starting my solo practice. And then from there, growing a team and all of those things that kind of came from from every point when I personally hit a wall and went, okay, I can't do this in this way anymore, or I can't do this by myself anymore. And I can't say that I haven't gotten to that point once again in the last year or two, but there are always, I'm someone that knows when I hit that point a lot faster now, because I've been cool. through it over and over and, you know, know when it's time to make some necessary changes. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder for you, like, since you say you've gotten better at noticing it quicker, Mm -hmm. what, and the signs are going to be individual for people, but I'm curious, like what you start to notice. I mean, I can sit here all day and tell you I'm stressed, but it's the like, I get to this point where I'm saying that so much to my husband or going to bed every night saying that where I'm like, okay, let's start to document. How many Mm -hmm. days of the week are you feeling like your quality of life is not where it should be, you know? And like, seriously, I I will get to the point where I'm like, let's take 30 days and mark it on the calendar, you know, and take a step back and look. And if the majority of the last 30 days, you can say, I didn't enjoy my life for the majority of the last 30 days, then it's time to make a change. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mic drop. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I've, I've heard the same said in, I mean, that could be applicable for anything, right? Like yeah. for a relationship. It's like, we know relationships have up yeah. and down, ups and downs. We know they can be hard. But if you look at the last 30 days and you're like, I've been pretty solidly unhappy, something big has got to change or this ain't going to work, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that idea of like zooming out you know, cause we lose the forest for the trees, especially when we're just like in survival mode. So mm-hmm, love mm-hmm. that idea of kind of tracking and like wev- whether that's a mood tracking app or a journal or yeah. whatever, right. Everyone yeah. can customize that for themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think exactly like you said, you can apply that to most things in life, like zoom out and go, hmm, this is not looking like it's worth it <laughs> anymore. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned when we connected before this, like that time management strategies are like just something you're really passionate about and me too, because it's just, I mean, as a business owner, when you're wearing multiple hats and you're also a mom, like it's, uh, it's kind of a necessary thing, but it's also kind of fun to play with and to tweak the dials around. So I'm curious if there's any strategies or practices that have become really go-tos for you. Yeah. I mean, I think first of all, like the reason that time management and learning real strategies, and this is something I teach in my program is so essential is because it does take some of those emotions out of the way you're feeling. Some of the stress and overwhelm comes from exactly that. Just the overwhelm of like the to-do list being greater than you can, than you have the capacity to understand like how you're going to get all of this done. So mm-hmm. a couple things I you know, look at my calendar as a whole. And I kind of break all my tasks down into a couple of camps, you know, into a couple of categories, knowing like, okay, here's my client work. Here is my admin work. Here's my marketing work. Here is my, I like to do a category called just like dream. This is the like, Mm. you know, expansive fun stuff. And then your white space, like no plans, Uh, you know? Yes. And know when in your week you're going to touch on all of those things. And I think that's my, that's my first like baseline is just knowing, okay, Friday's when this is happening, or maybe Mm -hmm. you touch on all, all of those things every day, but you know where it's happening. But my biggest like hack, if you will, is so simple 
And it's just that I don't, I don't keep that running to-do list where I can see it every day. I don't keep the like 20 things in front of me. I pick three to five things off of that giant list and know that like, this is for today and keep the other stuff out of sight, out of mind. And it's like, if my head hits the pillow tonight and I've accomplished the three things that I set out to do, I'm going to feel better about myself and I'm going to sleep better than if I had accomplished five things off the list of 20 and I feel bad about it, you know? Yes. Amen. I am always saying like, you just need your daily view, right? Because otherwise it can feel so overwhelming. And like you said, Mm -hmm. even if you're doing the same amount of work or even less, if you're looking at that big overwhelming picture, it's just like starts to feel crushing. So I love that tip. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So you opened was your was it your studio or just your practice mm-hmm. you opened that during like early covid right yeah so i had my solo practice and through a lot of soul searching in this like entire year of like yeah burnout hitting that wall knowing i needed to change something i decided to open like i mean this is opening the actual business right like you can be a solopreneur and rent a room and it's so vastly different than a like, practitioner of, versus a business owner a right business owner yeah of you know finding a building building it out gutting the thing hiring a staff like doing the thing signing a five-year um, lease <laughs> yeah so i I spent nine months searching for a building, trying to find the right contractors, getting all the pieces in place. In February of 2020, I signed my lease and I took out a personal loan and I wrote a $25,000 check to a contractor and said, let's go. And oh, I'm like breaking later, out into hives listening. I know. It was, I mean... <laughs> Three weeks later, COVID was declared a pandemic. And a week after that, our whole industry entered entered mandatory shutdown. So we weren't even open yet, but I like couldn't take it back. (laughs) They were like, I mean, we had already knocked down walls. We had like, it was happening. And so it was like a situation where the only way out is through. We have to trust that we're going to be able to work and like, keep this construction project going but it was it was the worst three months of my life (laughs) yeah and to some degree like like a lot of life's challenges that just get sort of thrown at us you had to roll with the punches like you had to just figure it out but you know sometimes the best gold in terms of like lessons and strengths that we build ends up coming from the shittiest thing so what do you Mm -hmm. feel like out of that experience of making this giant leap at like, in hindsight, the worst Mm -hmm. time. Yeah. (laughs) What gold came out of that experience? I mean, for me, I just have so much more faith in myself Mm. than I've ever had before. And making big leaps is a lot less scary. Like there's, I can't think of anything that could happen that would be worse than that, (laughs) you know? And I'm just like, Every time I want to do something crazy, I'm like, let's do it. (laughs) I could, if I survive that, I could weather this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Relativity is powerful. So yeah, (laughs) very much agree. Cool. And one of the things that you said that I thought was interesting too, is because, you know, on this show, I like to talk about people's experiences with Mm -hmm. therapy and with coaching. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear I know you said a little bit in the form, but like mm-hmm. what you, what your view is on both of those things and just where you've found value in what ways. Yes. So I am a huge fan of therapy and coaching. Um, I will always have a therapist. I'm never going to not have a therapist. Like even if I'm okay, I just, all you know, like I think, I think it's just super important to have somebody there for when shit hits the fan, like, yep. and some touch point throughout the week, even to like celebrate, you know, Mm -hmm. your successes with you. I, but what I'll say is I am, I do think for me that coaching, the experience that I have with it has been a lot more effective for me. And, you know, there's, 
obviously a lot of differences we could go into. And I actually haven't worked specifically with like a life coach, but there are times when like my business coach, my business coach, you know, yeah, has been more valuable than a therapist because it's like, you're speaking to me and the stressors that I'm dealing with. And we may not be talking about a mental disorder, but we're talking about the stress level that people in my situation experience. And for me, coaches have been able to speak more into that and actually give helpful insight more so than a therapist that is so essential to like listen and hold space for that. But I've had coaches that'll like, you know, they'll interrupt me and be like, excuse me. No, here is what, <laughs> you know, and someone like me, like that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and ex it, that you said it perfectly, like obviously if someone is working through acute mental health challenges, like yeah. you want to be doing that with a therapist, but when you're not necessarily, that's not the thing that's causing distress, then having someone who's got that insight in a little bit more into the type of situation that you're in, even if their job is not to tell you what to do, they're going to help you parse it out more effectively. Yeah. So yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, it's funny when you mentioned like just always having a therapist like i i will often say like i'm not always in therapy but i have yeah. a therapist it's kind of like totally. how you know once i expanded my business i was like shit i guess i better like have an attorney yeah and so i'm like totally. oh yeah i have an no, attorney but i like hopefully only have to talk to her like rarely <laughs> yeah i love that it really is the same like <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's you like, I just, it's are. my little security blanket and knowing that I have that. Yeah, <laughs> She's there. Totally. Uh, that's yep. great. Cool. <laughs> Let's see. I know one of the things that we wanted to explore is just body acceptance working yeah. in the beauty industry. I'm sure that it is just a whole mess of things. And mm -hmm. yet there's a lot of people like yourself who are like, how can we do this work? And I mean, literally in the name of your podcast and your handle in an integrated yeah. way. So if there's yeah. anything you just want to like kind of share about in terms of how you view working in sort of the skincare aesthetics space and also like supporting body autonomy and acceptance, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So I've been on such a journey with this. I mean, with myself, of course, but with the kinds of clients I work with and early on in my career, obviously, like I was working for other people. I didn't get to choose my client base, not even necessarily the kinds of services I was doing, but early mm -hmm. on, I was doing a lot of really more like beauty services. I was doing eyelashes and brows and like these instant gratification, like make me pretty quick kind of services. And I will say lash extensions in particular was my bread and butter for years. Wow. And it was very hard to quit. I hated it most of that time for so many reasons. <laughs> and that was a big burnout, like pivot yeah. moment for Golden me when handcuffs. I said, like, I'm not doing this service mm -hmm. anymore. But part of it, I hated it for a lot of reasons. It was tedious. It hurt my neck. Like, I mean, I was in physical therapy for a year after I wow. quit because like it jacks your body up. But I really hated that like the majority of my clients were coming for this thing. They would come in obsessively, you know, yeah. every two weeks, they couldn't go without them. If something fell out over on this corner, it was like, panic calling. Can I get in? Like, I can't be in public without this. And just mm. the thought that I'm like feeding these women's addiction to this beauty thing. And I'm like supporting this almost like body dysmorphia that they're having of like, I can't not have this thing on my face or mm. I can't be seen in the world. And that's so like, not who I am. And it, I went through a couple years where I was like really icked out with my career in general, because mm. I was just supporting that in people. And I made a couple of big pivots in the services I was offering. And then just the messaging, I stopped using messaging that the whole beauty industry uses of like, yeah. here are these before and afters. And don't you want, I don't know, like there's so much ick out there, you know, in the marketing of these things. And I just started being like, no, come here because you enjoy it because it's fun. Like, even if you are a girl that wants to pile on the makeup and wants the eyelashes and whatever, do it 
for you because it's like playful. It's expressive. It's a way that you like to see yourself, but not that you hate yourself without it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think gradually over the years, just that change in messaging and the change in the services that I've promoted have built this like incredible clientele for the business that I have now of just like beautiful, diverse people of all shapes and sizes and colors that really aren't, that aren't sitting there and looking at themselves in the mirror and going like, can you fix this and this and this and this and the anxiety around Mm -hmm. that. When we do get those people, it's kind of a beautiful place to be able to walk them through that and hopefully help them help them through it, help them come out the other side. But it is something that I take a look at the people in my business right now. And I'm like, this is really cool compared to the kinds of people I was, I was serving and surrounding myself with 10, 15 years ago. Sure. Oh, that makes so much sense. And, and I think there's, you know, there's transformative work that can happen. Like even I read some of the quotes on your website and it's like, you know, if you've got someone who's got like cystic, painful acne and stuff and like, it's sure there's the aesthetic element of that, but there's also the quality of life element. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to support someone in, in walking through and like finding actual, treatment that works for that. I mean, that's got to be so rewarding. Yeah. And that's a lot that really is rewarding because that's something that of course people don't like the way they look, but like you said, it's, it's a quality of life thing. And that's like really making a difference. Mm -hmm. Yep. And just kind of philosophically, I've been questioning some of the, it's so, it's so tricky because on one hand, like you said, feeding into the notion that like, we all need to fit into this narrow standard of beauty. Like that doesn't feel good. I don't want to, you know, align with that. But at the same time, there's something to be said for, well, why not do what you can to feel comfortable in your skin if it's not harming you and it's Mm -hmm. not pathological, (laughs) you know, it's not to a point where it's like such a rigidity and obsession that like, it is sort of harming you in a way. So it just gets tricky because like things like plastic surgery and all that, like, I think growing up, I would have thought like, oh, well that's like for vain rich people. And like, also why would you do that? It means you don't love yourself. And now I feel very differently. And and then it's tricky when you add in the aging thing too, because it's like, well, on one hand, I want people to know that they absolutely can embrace their signs of aging. And who am I to say for me or anyone else, like what they should or shouldn't do if yes. getting a treatment makes them feel more comfortable in their skin? Yeah, exactly that. I mean, the whole like controversy of like, should we get Botox or not? Mm-hmm. And I have been on that side of it where I was like, you shouldn't do that, you know? And like, if you're doing that, you must not love yourself. And that's really mean. <laughs> and like, that's, I, you know, you do what you want to do. I think- yeah. I think when we get to the point where like, that's the standard and we think everyone has to do that, that that's a problem or you have to look this way. But if you want to, like, it's your body. Same reason I got tattoos on my body because I like them, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Well, I I probably am going to drop this in the intro because it's, and talk a little bit more about it there, but I'll mention it briefly here too, Mm because it's something that to some degree will probably be just a noticeable thing, but it's it's a big deal that that I just recently decided I've been insecure about my nose my entire life. Mm, and yeah. and I, so I used to think what I said before, like, well, I just yeah. can't do anything about it. Like, no, yeah. of course not. And recently I was like, I'm 37 years old. Why the fuck not? Yeah. Why not, right? Yeah. So literally yesterday, I mean, I did a bunch of research. I went to meet with a doctor for a consultation And I'm going to get a nose job in like two, a month. So yeah, it's like, and being able to own that, especially in the work that I do of being like, listen, what if we can hold both of these things of, Mm -hmm. I don't not love myself, but if I can feel, if I can not think about this thing on my face, every time I take pictures and stuff, wouldn't that be cool? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I love that. I love that. It popped into my head as you were saying, it's like another Another thing that like in my business, we've removed from, like I said, like the marketing of how we talk about things is this whole, 
the term anti-aging like really bugs yeah, sure you know and that's on everything yes and I mean I've said it for so many years it's not even a bad thing anymore these are your mm. acne products these are your anti-aging products yep and now we're coming up with like new ways to say that we say age management or age support or something mm. along those or lines. Or like skin you know? smoothing. Why can't we just, yeah. you know, talk about what it's bringing us? Just say what it does, <laughs> yeah. you know, but it's all anti this and this yeah. is bad. And like, we're yeah. all aging from birth, you know, yeah. like that's, right. not, that's not this terrible thing to be scared of. Right. Exactly. And I think, again, there's probably a way to honor both of like, mm -hmm. how can we stop vilifying that, especially for women on a yeah. larger scale. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we need to shame ourselves or anyone else. Mm -hmm. If there's certain ways that we decide that we want to sort of like work with that in our own experience. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. So there's something that you mentioned that I really related to just in my profession as a therapist that we we don't really get much education at all about the business yeah. side of things. And I'm just like so jazzed to see what you've been up to recently yeah. and what you're offering now. So yeah. I would love to just hear like, what do you want to say about your industry when it comes to that? Yeah. So, I mean, I've known this for a long time because I'm someone who went to aesthetic school and learned nothing and spent honestly the first five years of my career struggling, struggling. Yeah, nothing about business, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah about business. I, I would say both though. I learned mm. nothing about skin or about Shit. Business. Both. <laughs> Just like I learned how to pass a test and then they're like, oh. good luck. Man, that um, sucks. And so I, I'll say I probably spent those first five years learning about skin Yeah. and then was like, well, why am I not busy still? And I had the luxury, honestly, if I am someone who went to aesthetic school at 19 years old when I lived in my parents' house mm -hmm. and I didn't have crazy expenses and I did have second jobs and I was able to stick it out through that first five years, the first eight years, to be honest, mm -hmm. of like learning all of this stuff. And then got to a point where I was super successful because I, I mean, I took class. I was never not in some kind of class for all cool. of those years over something. But then honestly, I feel like it really slapped me in the face. The biggest, when I opened my business and started interviewing people, I lucked out, lucked out with mm -hmm. my first round of girls. I had like three girls right out the gate who I hired, who were experienced. And I just thought, well, this is easy. <laughs> And then, you know, went through the process of needing to hire again. Some of those girls, you know, moved out of state and most of the applicants I get are straight out of school and you should be able to work in your profession. If you've gone to school and received a license in it, you should, um, but they're not, they're not anywhere near ready and, and I'm nowhere near. And so now I'm four years in and I've hired multiple girls out of school, wonderful, lovely people, some of whom who are still with me today. And it has no joke taken me two years, two full years of like my own blood, sweat, tears, anxiety, and stress to get these girls where they need to be. And then I have had to pay them that whole time to learn from me and then hope they stick around that long. Yeah. And over and over and over again, they don't. And the problem that I think is presenting itself is in our industry, as I'm sure yours is similar, is that, I mean, the the material, if you go to aesthetic school today, the material you're learning was written decades and, I mean, in the 60s, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> That's like, crazy. And this career that long ago, was how to put cucumbers on someone's eyes and like make a hot <laughs> towel, you know? Yeah. And they just want you to learn proper like sanitation and about bloodborne pathogens and like check that off the list and pass a test about it. Wow. And then you're like, yeah. here you go. Good luck. Yeah. And so they, they're coming out of school with no skin knowledge, no business knowledge, if I can give them the skin knowledge, then they still come work for me and go like, okay, where are the clients? And I'm like, um, you got to get them. You know, like I did, like I hustled for years and years and years 
But what ends up happening is like the whole burden of education is put on very small businesses like mine. And it is, it is a financial strain. Mm. It is, we don't have the time for it, you know, and it's creating these really kind of really tough relationships between small businesses and the people they're trying to employ. And then the girls straight out of school, ultimately, like most of them don't last two or three years. That is the average lifespan of an esthetician right now is three years. Wow. And people leave in debt and like really defeated and feeling a lot of shame, feeling really bad about themselves because they went through all this training and they did all of this and they got a job and then they flopped Mm -hmm. and they don't have the money left over to invest in additional education and all of this stuff to get them where they need to be. Yeah. And small businesses like mine can't afford to buy all that training for them. Yeah. Yeah to buy the training or to essentially be a free school that's, you know, not even a free school, a school that we pay you to come to and then hope it works out. But if you can get the educate, the skincare education under your belt, which is like the first thing you've got to know your stuff. Fortunately, there are books out there. There are podcasts. There are lots Mm -hmm. of resources. If you work with any brand right now, like there are, there are plenty of trainings that you can get. But again, we go back to that. You've got to know how to manage your time. You know, Mm -hmm. you've got to know how to like, this is your job now and you can't quit learning and all of this. But the business skills, even if you're an employee, you know, of like how, how to do social media, how to market yourself, how to get clients in the door, keep them coming back, how to sell retail, which is not just about money, but about like your client's success and their longevity with you. So you have to learn how to be a salesperson. You have to learn how to follow up with people. And again, time management, you have to learn how to do all of those things, have all of those things in your skill sets and not get paid for most of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, use that to do the job that you love, that you went to school for. And basically I got to a point four years in now to earn, owning my clinic where I was like, okay, I have spent over a decade paying to learn. And now I am paying to teach and the people I'm paying to teach are resentful because they just want to work, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the most recent wall that I hit of like, no more, you know, we are not going to just be in this vicious cycle anymore of hiring people, trying to train them, them getting mad and quitting. Um, and so that is why I've kind of transitioned into the education space and I've created two different online courses specifically for service providers in the beauty industry. One is for people that are like right out of school. This is what you do next. The other is for like, okay, maybe you've got five years under your belt. Maybe you went solo and you kind of got ahead of yourself (laughs) and you're like, okay, what do I do now? I don't know anything about business. So I've got those two things that, you know, I've tried to price in a way that's really accessible to people in that space, but be just kind of like exactly everything I've seen in my 14 years, but seen with my employees and in interviews and just this nonstop issue over the past four years, I've been able to kind of distill everything that I wish I could take out of my brain and put into somebody else's into into these courses. So I'm really excited about that. Not, not just for me and my business, but for the industry to kind of have a resource to be like, this is how it is, but this can be your next step. Mm -hmm. Incredible. I love it. My uh, younger stepsister is actually going through esthetician training right now yeah yeah. and I don't understand any of it it's like we got to do the nails one and then we do this one and then it's it's like (laughs) it's bizarre because it's like she only wants to do like a piece of it but she has to do all anyway so I'm like I'm like already scheming in my head like ooh, how can we do like a combined Christmas present and get this for her (laughs) yeah yeah totally I mean that's part of it too is that you've got to learn stuff you'll never use in school just Yeah. yeah it's like all that random stuff And then the other issue is that a lot of the schools are owned by skincare companies. And so it's kind of just indoctrination into their products. 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> and you're not really learning anything about like science or skin. Yeah. You're just learning. Just like, use this because we tell this. you that you need to. Mm -hmm. And here's the fancy yeah. like marketing science behind it. Yeah. I mean, it's really genius for those companies. Like that yeah. has been their next thing is well, let's open schools. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Well, it sounds like a huge service to your industry and, and, and hopefully will also really help your clinic flourish yeah. and you to, you know, really step into the leadership that, that you should be at this point mm -hmm. and, and all the stuff that you've had to learn the hard way and can help yeah. other people learn a little quicker, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even for my own team, I'm making them go through the courses because it's like, yes. I know you have me here, but there's only one of me and there's lots of you and we can like sit down for six hours a day and let me talk at you or like, this is just much more streamlined in a way that I can be like, here, just watch this, do the tests, you know? <laughs> yep. Love it. Amazing. Oh, I was going to ask you, I mentioned before we press record that I'm like, I know almost nothing about skincare. So we're not yeah. going to get into a whole skincare discussion, but if there's yeah. anyone else who's kind of in a similar boat where it's like, I don't know, every six months I'll walk into Ulta and be like, mm -hmm. I don't know what I need. Just help me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So other than wear sunscreen, what would mm -hmm. be like your number one thing that you wish everyone knew about skincare? Okay, well, you've got it. That's the first one is wear <laughs> sunscreen. So you do know something. Yeah. Okay, I would say we kind of break this into two camps. If you have healthy skin, if you don't have, this is kind of like, you know, the therapist versus the coach conversation. Yes. If you have an acute <laughs> disorder, um, right. then like you need to be seeing an esthetician. If you yeah. have an acne problem, if you have rosacea, if you have eczema, you need to be seeing an esthetician. And I say esthetician even over dermatologist. Mm -hmm. Dermatologist is when you get into not just skin disorders, but skin diseases, you know? Gotcha. And that's where like maybe even eczema is pushing into the dermatologist category. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about like skin cancer, you know, like different, you need to see a dermatologist. Estheticians are educated on skin care, how to take care of your skin for different conditions. So dermatologists have no idea what cleansers are on the market and what to do with them. You know, they're going to diagnose a disease and put you on a medication. We help build a routine, you know, for, to fix it. And even for acne, you know, we're going to talk about food. We're going to talk about all the different lifestyle things that play into it. So if you have a skin disorder, you need to be seeing an esthetician. If you don't, and you want to walk into Ulta or whatever and grab some skincare off the shelf, my number one thing is if you, if you want budget friendly products, if you want over the counter products, go simple, you know, don't mm. fall for all of the marketing terms. If you want to buy something from Ulta or Sephora or Walgreens, like go for it, but leave the actives to the professionals. So uh. don't try and buy an over the counter vitamin C or retinol or anything like that. That's where you may want to splurge a little bit on your products because you're just not getting it in the formulations that you should, if it's a $15 product, like it's sure. not, a, you know, yep. and in a lot of cases it can be harmful because maybe it was in there, but if it's at this strength and if it's in the, if it's in a plastic container, it's oxidized and it's probably going to irritate your skin and all of this kind of stuff. So that, that's my main thing is really like, if you want to shop simple keep it simple. Look for hydrating, nourishing ingredients and protect your skin, wear your sunscreen. And then if you want to splurge on a product or two, go to an esthetician and get like a really good retinol or vitamin C or whatever it is that you need. Ooh, great advice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, it'll be in the show notes, but tell the people where they can find you online and how yes. they can learn more if they are in the industry or they mm -hmm. know someone who is about these courses. Yeah. I mean, so the best way to find me is on Instagram at the integrated esthetician and it's esthetician with an E. We all get very confused on how to spell that. So I just simplified it. <laughs> and then my business itself, if you are in Nashville is Prism Face Lab. And you can also find that on Instagram or our website, prismfacelab.com. But if you go to the integrated esthetician on Instagram, you can find the podcast, you can find the courses, all of that, and kind of dive into education there. 
Incredible. Well, this has been so much fun. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me. This has been great.